So now we're going to talk about the process. And the first step of the process is the evaluation. And this is when you sit down and you talk with the client. So you, you're starting to build rapport. And this is when you use a lot of um, a holistic approach and a client-centered approach, which we will talk about a little bit later on, which is really, really important to um, occupational therapy. And so when you're doing the first uh, part of the evaluation, which is the occupational profile, is uh, when you're just getting to know the patient, you want to see uh, what their interests are, what their values are, uh, their meaning meaningful occupation. So for example, if they're active like tennis, if they have to cook, um, whether they have children, where do they live in, uh, do they live in a, in a one-story house, in a two-story house, um, in a rural neighborhood, you're just getting to know a little bit more about themselves. In order to, um, to help you understand who they are, and in order to help you, uh, I guess, to get goals, um, to implement some goals later on. And then the second part of the evaluation is the analysis of occupational performance. And this is when you look at more of the problems that they have um, in doing like their occupations. So for example, if you're looking at somebody that is uh, getting out of the bathroom, uh, you see like, why, why are they having trouble getting out of the bathroom? Is it something cognitive? Is it something, um, is it because they have disease? Do they have dementia? So you're looking more into like what the problems are. And then we have an intervention. This is a really important process. It's made out of three parts. So the first one is the intervention plan. Then we have intervention implementation. And lastly, we have the intervention review. And for the intervention plan, this is when you're trying to figure out what goals you want to decide to, uh, to make the client have. And it's made out of three steps. So the first step is develop, develop the plan. So you make sure it's something that's measurable and um, it can be maintained or modified because sometimes these uh, goals could be a little bit easy for them and they need a little bit more challenge. So you need to be able to, uh, to grade the activity. Uh, secondly, we have consider potential discharge needs and plans. Uh, because you, like when you make a plan, you always have to have a discharge plan. You need to know where the clients, um, if they have like a safe place to go after. And lastly, we have make recommendations or referrals to other professionals as needed. So once we're done, once they're done with our services, they might need some other help. They might need, uh, I don't know, some, to go to a psychologist or some other help. And lastly, we have targeting outcomes and consent time. <laughs> and this is you look at the health, the participation, and engagement in occupations. And again, as I said before, um, you have to make goals that are measurable, attainable, and that can be modified. That's very, very important. So outcomes are the end result of the occupational therapy process is what they are gonna get out of our services. Uh, for instance, if they're working at um, increasing their fine motor skills, uh, gross motor skills, so it all depends on what the client needs and what their meaningful occupations are. Okay, so for a client-centered and holistic approach, um, this is just a term that we use in occupational therapy a lot, client-centered, and that is a description of the viewpoint we take when working with clients. So we want to make sure that our whole interaction and our treatment is focused on what each individual really cares about, what's meaningful in their life, and what are the barriers that they face personally. And as an OT, we make all of our services just wrapped around the specific condition, experience, um, and client factors that we talked about before of each individual. So when we talk about client-centered in the future, just have that in your mind. Um, and when we, this, the whole person, so that's where we talked about a holistic viewpoint, a holistic approach for occupational therapy. We look at the whole person and that is, and you'll see this image in the handout that we gave you. And that's all of these things. It's not only their skills, but it's also um, what their family, it's their beyond themselves, their personal style, but also yeah, their family, their values. You have to think about all contexts that they live their life in. As far as meaningful occupations, so we defined occupations already for you, the activities that people do in their everyday life. Um, well, meaningful because maybe not everything is so meaningful and everyone has a different definition of what's meaningful to them. 
So meaningful occupations. What are the activities that this client finds the most important in their life? Um, by addressing these meaningful occupations, we're gonna get at, uh, we're going to, as OTs, promote, facilitate, support, and maintain health and participation in their life. So focusing on health and well-being of the individual. And helping them get to the point to jump over the barriers they face in order to engage in these meaningful occupations. That's the kind of goal of OT. And there's many things that you will focus on when working with a client and it is gonna range from their, it could be medical equipment, it could be emotional support, it could be factors such as relationships, um, it could also be helping them connect to other resources. So helping the person you're working with get in touch with what else is out there in the community that can help them reach their goals. So um, this is a good time to mention the fact that occupational therapists love working in multiple, um, in multidisciplinary teams. So especially in the community setting, when we're out here working in another organization or working with people in the community, it's great. OTs love it when we can get together with different disciplines and work together to help the clients. So oftentimes, OTs work side by side, physical therapists or speech therapists or social workers um, or other professionals that are just out there to help the people in the community. Now we talk about meaningful occupations um, and how important they are and that they really just help the person and all of us, they help us thrive in our life and have the highest possible quality of life. Well, what happens when you can't do your meaningful occupations? We call that occupational deprivation. So there are external circumstances or factors that will contribute to somebody having occupa being occupationally deprived. And some examples we have are certain illnesses. Maybe it's a mental health issue or condition. It could be a physical disability or incarceration, which I know everyone here at Project Kinship is familiar with the population of formerly incarcerated individuals, and we'll kind of touch on that a bit more as we proceed with the presentation. Um, but just recognizing that when you are in that situation, when you are incarcerated, your environment, it's totally different. You have created all of these new mechanisms for interacting with a different environment, you come back to the community when you're released from prison and everything has shifted and now you have to change back to operating your life in a new environment um, where you didn't have access to so many of your meaningful occupations. Um, so um, there's often the social and behavioral effects that come after being in a situation where your occupations are limited. Um, and a lot of the challenges that we're reading in the current literature about the population of formerly incarcerated individuals has to do with sort of this response to a change in occupation, in everyday occupation and engagement in their life. 